the core concept within the Anthropocene and why I think uh, it's a useful concept beyond other environmental concepts that we've had in the last few decades is that it's, it encapsulates this concept that humanity is large relative to the other processes of the planet. Uh, and so, that we, uh, 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 and, uh, so and what this means is that uh, you know, collectively we are large, both in our numbers but all particularly in our activities, and everything we do keeps on knocking against boundaries. Uh, how much we consume starts hitting boundaries, how much we emit as waste gases starts hitting boundaries, how much land we use starts hitting boundaries. And, uh, uh, and this means that the challenges that we face are globally constrained for the first time in our history, rather than locally constrained, and that they are uh, they're multifaceted and they're entangled. And this is what I think is captured in the Anthropocene. So examples are that we cannot think about development, industrialization, global justice, without thinking about greenhouse gas emissions and, and, and climate. We can't think about biodiversity conservation without thinking about food supply. Uh, we can't think about our diets without thinking about global land area. So all these problems become interlinked in a way that they've always been interlinked in human history at the local level, but now the, the, there's a whole new range of factors working at the, at the global level uh, that constrain them. And this, to me, is the, the useful concept in, in this Anthropocene meaning. As to uh, when it started, uh, the, the conventional idea is that uh, it's proposed that it started somewhere around the start of the Industrial Revolution, when fossil fuel emissions started to pick up, so around 1800. There are arguments saying that 1950 is a particularly appropriate start, because that's really when uh, there's this great acceleration in human impacts uh, on the planet. Others argue that uh, you could push back further to, uh, to the uh, 2000 BC, when extensive agriculture uh, appeared uh, on the planet. Or there are arguments for even, even earlier on that, that I'll, I'll get on to uh, uh, in a moment. Okay, so that's the overall uh, concept of the, the Anthropocene as it stands. So, so now I'll just uh, think about a couple of uh, perhaps more disruptive and provocative ideas uh, around uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this Anthropocene paradigm. And one in particular is this idea of a relatively environmentally benign antiquity and a modern disruptive industrialized modernity. And uh, I'll pick on a couple of ideas here. And one of them, and anybody who knows me knows that I've been thinking about this quite a lot recently, is the, 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 the Pleistocene megafauna. And the, the Pleistocene megafauna are interesting even if you have no interest in animals or ecosystems. Because I think trying to understand what happened there nor that our sense of who we are as humanity and our identity, and as a, uh, our human identity, the nature of human relationships to the environment. And the basic idea here is that at just before the dawn of, of the near subtle, subtle civilizations, there were large animals everywhere. So the scenes that we now associate with East Africa, with the Serengeti, etc., were scenes that we would have seen almost anywhere on the planet 10 to 15,000 years ago, which on the Earth system timescales is just yesterday. This is not dinosaurs, this is not the deep past. And this is a, a scene of where we could imagine in South America around 15,000 years ago, uh, which is probably the highest large animal diversity in the world, much higher than East Africa uh, or Southern Africa. Uh, uh, North America would have been similar. Australia, if you go back 40,000 years ago, would have been a different range of animals, but, 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 but similar. It says everywhere was full of large creatures. And they all disappeared around the time of human spread out of Africa, modern human spread and arrival. And now, I should, I should say, there is, a, there is a long debate, a vigorous debate, about the relative role of humans and climate in this. And this is, I can't go into here, but we can, we can discuss. Uh, from my perspective, I would say that once you start, there, there, there's a case to be made for climate versus humans in Europe and maybe in North America, but once you start taking a global perspective, it's very hard not to see a strong human role in the disappearance of these large creatures. That around the time that humans arrive in places, these large creatures disappear. And that matters not only because of the biodiversity of these large creatures, but because they were large. They were ecosystem engineers. They structured the types of ecosystems that existed the nutrient cycling, the biogeochemistry, the tree cover of its ecosystems. And, uh, uh, and, if, and one example of that is, uh, until the late Pleistocene, there were elephants everywhere. And it, this was really the planet of the elephants. Apart from Australia, every other significant land mass had species of elephants uh, roaming the landscape, engineering the landscape in the way that they do in Africa uh, today. And uh, uh, so, uh, so if we accept this human role in these extinctions, I'm open to a discussion about that, it, uh, uh, it suggests that some of the most profound impacts that we had as humans were before we were even farmers. 
even at the stage of hunter-gatherers moving out of Africa, as super predators moving into a landscape of ecologically naive animals who were disrupting ecosystems, altering ecosystems. So even areas that we think of now as pristine and wild are actually carry the footprints of our fingerprints of humanity uh, deep in the past. And, uh, and, uh, and that ignores that our sense of what is natural in nature, what, what is the status, what is the pre anthropocene status of the planet that we're moving away from. Uh, another thing to that I'd like to dwell on is how recent these timescales are. But when we, we, we tend to focus on human timescales and think of 2,000 years of the time of Christ as ancient, uh, 4,000 years the ancient Egyptians as particularly, uh, uh, particularly ancient, and once we get it back in 6,000, 8,000 years, this is deep time past. In terms of Earth's biogeochemical and ecological timescales, these are all just yesterday. Tiny, uh, a, a, a tiny fraction of the timescales on which biogeochemical processes, ecological and evolutionary processes uh, uh, evolve. And so when we look at history, uh, when often there's a tendency to think of past civilizations as somehow, because they move more slowly, are being more at equilibrium with their environments. But actually most of these societies are societies in disequilibrium and with their environmental conditions, constantly hitting local boundaries, meeting, facing some of the boundaries, the challenges that we face at a global scale, at the local scale of of land area, food supply, uh, uh, resource supply, and uh, and so the much of our history is always about disequilibria uh, on, on these very short timescales, and also legacies of previous disequilibria, uh, the extinctions of large animals, the, uh, the the post the end of the ice ages. Uh, so, uh, so given this, uh, how do we uh, respond? If we see the footprints of humanity everywhere. Uh, uh, at a stage earlier than the, than, than the conventional you know, industrial era anthropocene, what's our, our response to that? Uh, what narrative can we have? Uh, there are dangers in that. There's a danger that we can move into a laissez-faire attitude and say, oh well, we've all, always been disrupting, we can continue to disrupt, that's just the nature of humanity. We can move into a despair, and George Monbiot had a little piece based on that conference where he just fundamentally despairs at the hyper predator that was humanity and the nature of humanity, or, well, or there are probably things in between that we can do. Uh, and, uh, uh, and one is this reconciliation, the recognition that human influence on the biosphere is pervasive and of long duration, and that we've always been creating new nature, that the ecosystems that we seem as pristine or wild are created landscapes in some extent, particularly because of the legacy of these megafaunal extinctions. Uh, and that the most constructive approach may be to encourage the building of new nature with caveats and cautions, uh, uh, rather than locking onto a particular natures of the past. And that makes us some exciting disruptive ideas around about what do we actually value about nature? Is it a particular species? Is it the general range of biodiversity? Or is it a functioning of the natural world? And uh, 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 so, the have been. So the narratives we could have, there are, there are these narratives of hope and despair. The things I would point out, from my perspective, is that humanity is something quite extraordinary in the history of the biosphere. And this is extraordinary, and has always had extraordinary consequences for the rest of the biosphere. Much of our environmental narrative, at the moment, the conservation narrative, has been one of retreat, of holding back the flood of human pressure on the environment. And there, there, there are important points in that narrative. But are there space for alternative narratives, more positive narratives. And at the moment in, in the conservation science there are a, quite a lot of exciting, quite disruptive, quite provocative ideas floating around, which have just appeared in the last few years and, uh, on a significant scale. And there's a couple of books here that, that capture some of these ideas. There are this idea of a, in the rambunctious garden about focusing, moving our attention, keeping the protected area focus, and moving into these more altered landscapes and understanding how can we maximize the utility and value of these landscapes in themselves rather than seeing as lost or degraded landscapes. And also this concept of rewilding, of bringing back wilderness to areas that we don't think of, of, of that. And one example that George Bombier particularly picks on is this, this, uh, I, this, this North Wales English rural landscape. That, and, I, and I've always struggled with this. I go to the Amazon, try and convince people about the, the reason to slow down deforestation and to not convert the Amazon into a cattle dominant landscape. And then I come back to the British landscapes, and this is a culturally valued concern, a, a landscape where intense conservation effort is put in to retain these culturally valued landscapes. And perhaps we need to 
certainly we, we need to be better, more flexible in the Amazon and how we view those changes, but also perhaps we need to be more flexible in, the, in our local context and what we decide deemed a fixed cultural landscape that we must hold on to and where we can be more flexible, have more, more bold ideas about, about changing these landscapes. Okay, and so just a, my final point then is, a, is, is a, it's, all, it's not just about how we view nature, but it's also about how we view ourselves. And there, there's a spectrum of views of how we can perceive ourselves. Now, as somebody who grew up on, on Star Trek, you know, one perspective I like to have is this, this noble agent of reason view of humanity that, that uh, we destined to create an ever more rational and well-managed global society and eventually move from this planet to a wider galaxy and have a, have a long destiny of rationality and reason in front of us. Uh, another, at the other end, we have a very misanthropic perspective view of humanity, the rapacious planet eater, a, a virus, a, an accidental accident of the biosphere, that's an experiment that's doomed to fail uh, because it's a sort of disequilibrium of engenders and uh, the, the disruptions it causes. And there are, these are two extremes, two caricatures. There are many other possibilities within this, between those two extremes. Uh, but there's also, and I'd like to discuss one, and this one I'll credit Tom, because you, you see part of the seed in me at the end of our little anthropocene and debate, and maybe we'll come up later. And one, one alternative vision is of the trickster. Uh, that, that is not a strong uh, concept in many of the, the, the dominant world religions, but in many indigenous uh, uh, religions is there. Uh, this is the character that is smart, often too smart for its own good, not evil or ill-intentioned inherently, but always getting into trouble, always tripping up, always creating, uh, generating mistakes, but also capable of extraordinary acts of creation and creativity. And maybe that's a more sympathetic view of where we are as humanity that, that we, can, we can play with. Okay, thank you.